Hello, everyone. We are now to our sixth and final region of Unit 1. So again, looking at AP World History, Unit 1 takes us from, um, it takes us up to about 1200. We're trying to get a sense of what the world looks like in 1200, and we have to bring in some background information. That's why in some regions we drop back to 600, other regions we pick up in 1000. It's kind of why we're all over the place. And I know many of you may be feeling overwhelmed with all this onslaught of information. But if you step back and kind of see the big picture, all we've been doing is hopping around the globe in about 1200, looking at these different civilizations and cultures that have emerged. We started with China, then we went to the Middle East, we went to South Asia, Southeast Asia, we went over to the Americas, then we went to Sub-Saharan Africa, and now we're gonna finish this little tour of the globe in Europe. So when we talk about Europe, what we wanna do is we wanna split Europe up into two parts, Western Europe and Eastern Europe. And when we look at it as having two different cultures, two different developments, Europe will start making a lot more sense to you. So we'll start first with West Europe. So, and I'll move myself down. I'm gonna be moving myself a lot through this lecture. So when we look at West Europe, the first thing I want you to understand is compared to the other regions we've talked about, West Europe is underdeveloped compared to all those other regions. And when I say that they're underdeveloped, underdeveloped, what I mean to say is that we don't see the level of technological, agricultural and intellectual innovation in 1100 that we're seeing across the globe. That's not to say there is an intellectual innovation. That's not to say that there is an agricultural improvement, but it's not on the scale that we see, for example, in Song China or that we see in the Inca Empire. So we want to understand in West Europe, we have small scale agriculture. So the agricultural system is built around a system called serfdom. And what serfdom does is it ties people to the land to work the land for a local landowner. We'll call this local landowner a noble. So you have a noble figure, he's a landowner, his wealth and strength is based on his landowning. And if you notice, I'm using the word he, that's because it's primarily a, a man's world at this time. Men can own property, women can under certain circumstances, but the law clearly favors men in this situation. So you have serfs, who are tied to the land. What that means is that they're not free to move about. Now that is gonna change later, but the idea of serfdom is that these serfs work the land and they grow food. Most of that food is gonna to go to the lord of the land. The rest of the food, the serf will keep. So agriculture is more of a, uh, a what we call sustenance. It's sustaining. Um, the, the life of a person. And we don't really see the significant surplus of crops that we see in other cultures. And we're talking 700, 800 CE, 900 CE. The other thing about serfdom is that it creates for a very static, um, very stale um, idea behind innovation. In other words, there's really no incentive to get better. If the farmers are just growing enough food to pay to the to the lords and enough food to eat there's really no reason to go out of your way to come up with a new way to do things there's no incentive to develop new ways of growing food the second thing is that western europe has a significant lack of trade connections to the rest of Afro eurasia so i've mentioned these trade routes the silk road the indian ocean trans-saharian trade and there are trade routes in West Europe, but not as extensively developed and not as prosperous as the, as the three I just mentioned. So what happens is that West Europe ends up on the periphery or on the outside of the Afro-Eurasian trade network. Are there Chinese goods in West Europe? Yes, but they're far and few in between. They largely belong to the wealthy of the wealthy. And the rest of the world, the rest of the Afro-Eurasian world, really has no interest in West European goods. There's, there's no demand for anything coming out of West Europe. And then the third thing working against West Europe 
is this lack of political unity. And that's where we pull in this idea called feudalism. Now we introduced feudalism back when we talked about Japan and this idea that in feudalism, the central power is weaker by the arrangements of the feudalism and the regional power, which in this case are your noble landowners, the regional power ends up with a considerable amount of, a considerable amount of independence and, and power. That power stems from their ability to maintain their own personal armies, their ability to kind of control the land that they live on. To the average serf, they don't answer to the king, they answer to the, to the local lord. So what you end up in West Europe is a political situation much different than we've seen in other parts of the world. The Song Dynasty was a central government over a considerable area. There is no European state. There's a bunch of small kingdoms who often battle with one another. Now, over time, those kingdoms will start to come together to form bigger states. States like France, Germ well, Germany is a different situation. France, Spain, uh, Denmark, Sweden. But even the development of those central states is done with a consideration for the regional landlords keeping some power. So feudalism prevents this type of political unity within Europe that we see elsewhere. The underpinnings of West Europe. So in other words, while we have these three things, and when I talk about letter A, I'm looking at around 700, 800 CE. But there are things that kind of create a, a basis for commonality throughout West Europe. One is the importance of the law. So West Europe is kind of built on the ruins of the Roman Empire. One of the things that the Roman Empire was, was noted for was their use of the law to govern social interaction. So one of the things I've been talking about is that different cultures, different civilizations regulate social interaction in different ways. So in India, social interaction, I apologize, in South Asia, social interaction was governed by the caste system. In China, social interaction was governed by the ideas of Confucianism. Within the Umayyad Caliphate, the behaviors of people were governed by Islam. So you have this idea that in Europe, it's the law, it's the written law, and that stems from the Roman time. The second thing is these Germanic tribes that are running all over the place. They have notable names such as the Goths. They really don't care about anything. Smoke cigarettes and drink coffee at Perkins. Um, you also have um, groups like the Franks, um, who are the nicest people you can ever meet. They're all named Frank, 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 Frank. And they're very honest with you uh, because they're very Frank. And then we also have other groups such as the Anglos and the Saxons. And their arrival into Britain, of course, is going to lead to the Anglo-Saxon. And these Germanic tribes, they influence the development of Western Europe um, culture and Western Europe um, practices for a long time within the language and within practices and customs that still impact Western society today. But then the third thing that unites West Europe is the Roman Catholic Church. And that's a holdover from the Roman Empire. One thing that you can find all throughout West Europe is a church. And those churches belong to a centralized hierarchy called the Catholic Church. So when I say that West Europe is decentralized and feudalistic, I'm talking more about the political system. The religious system does have a bureaucracy. The religious system does have a central source of power. And oftentimes this religious authority, this religious institution competes with the political authority of the local level. And that creates a church state conflict. Well, that continues a long time after this. You know, it continues for well over 1500 years. So as we continue to look at the overview of Western Europe, you're, gonna, you, you're welcome to watch this, but the crash course on the Dark Ages kind of talks about how dark the Dark Ages were. For Western Europe, this is not exactly a time of innovation and change, even though there is some innovation and change in some spots. 
But what's happening in the Middle East, for example, um, you know, in the Abbasid dynasty, the Abbasid Caliphate, what's happening in the Song dynasty, those represent innovations and developments that we're not necessarily seeing in West Europe. So when we call something the Dark Ages, we're really referring to Western European history versus global history. And if you take a look at D, the map and political division, if you just take a look at Europe around 1000, and you see these variety of smaller kingdoms, these, this is the political situation. And if you remember, fragmented and decentralized. I mean, look at Great Britain, for example. It's divided up into a number of smaller kingdoms. And what is today Ireland is divided up into smaller kingdoms. So you have these, and, and Italy is divided up into smaller kingdoms. You don't have um, a unified state. You have lots of kingdoms with lots of different languages, different customs, different traditions, and all of that creates for a very competitive environment within this particular area. So there's a great emphasis on, on controlling militaries. There's a great emphasis on competition. And that's something that as we go through history, we're going to see how that impacts the development of this area. Then we get to the Crusades. And the Crusades, what you want to do is you want to think of the Crusades as a changing point for West Europe. Because the Crusades are going to get West Europe more connected directly to after Eurasia. So the brief overview, I don't want to go into a lot of detail, but if you remember the Seljuk Turks, um, as they expand, they go into the Middle East. And one of the cities that they take over and occupy are, is Jerusalem. Western Europeans, small groups, made pilgrimages to Jerusalem. The Seljuk Turks cut that off. And the Pope decides to use that as an opportunity to promote unity under the Pope, under the Catholic Church, by launching a crusade to retake the Holy Land. And what happens over from 1095 to about 1100 is the crusaders from West Europe invade into what is today Israel. And that invasion is what we call the Crusades. And there's a series of Crusades after that. What they do is they set up kingdoms in the Middle East. So here in this world of the Seljuk Turks, um, we suddenly discover a West European kingdom. And this is really critical to the change. The Crusaders are going to be referred to as Franks by the um, Arabs of the region. And you're going to start seeing an interaction between Arabs and West Europeans. And this interaction is initially very violent, but then over time, we have cultural diffusion, we have syncretism, all those things that we've always looked for. Now, at some point, the Arabs are going to kick out, actually, I think it's the Seljuk Turks, are gonna kick out the Crusaders for good. And by 1291, that European presence in the Middle East has been taken care of. It's now back um, into the control of Muslim states, and the West Europeans are back in West Europe. But the lasting legacy of the Crusades, which is really the important thing, is that the, the Islamic world influences Europe. The intellectual ideas, the mathematical and the scientific ideas, the, um, the Greek ideas that were preserved within the scholarship of, of the Arab world, that makes its way to West Europe. Now, it had already been developing in Spain, but the, wet, the rest of West Europe is going to start getting exposed to these ideas of science and mathematics. And that's going to start a process of Western Europe becoming engaged in the greater world and also starting those intellectual and technological innovations which are so important to the development of any region. The technological developments um, can be something as simple as the magnetic compass starts to make its way into Western Europe. So the magnetic compass, an invention of the Chinese that works its way into the Indian Ocean trade, up the Red Sea, into the Mediterranean during the Crusades, that technology is being transported back to West Europe. So the Crusades are beginning this process 
of West Europe connecting with the greater Afro-Eurasian world and is beginning to lay the foundations for future changes that we'll study later. Then at the same time that you have the Crusades, you have in about 900, 1000, 1100, and 1200, the growth of trade along the Mediterranean Sea. Now there used to be trade in the Mediterranean Sea, but then the Roman Empire collapsed and cities on the coast began to decline. So if you remember, one of the things I've been trying to emphasize is that when there's political stability, political stability promotes and supports economic activity. If I create political instability, such as the fall of the Roman Empire in 476 CE, then I promote economic instability and trade declines. If trade is declining, cities that rely on trade decline as well. In 1000, political stability is returning, and there's a variety of factors that go into that. Um, for one thing, Viking raids throughout the Mediterranean Sea begin to decline. And when that happens, cities on the coast begin to grow again, and trade starts to grow throughout the Mediterranean Sea. And if you look at the map, you can see those dotted red dots going to the Middle East, such as Jerusalem and Cairo and Damascus. And as you might suspect, and actually if I lift myself up by my cursor, and you see this city called Constantinople, these red dots are gonna connect this world to the Silk Road and to the Indian Ocean Trade Network. So now what the Mediterranean Sea is doing is becoming an increasing trade um, route, an increasing uh, region of trade. And what's happening is that products coming from the Silk Road and from the Indian Ocean Trade Network are making their way into the Mediterranean Sea and thus impacting the rest of Europe. Some cities, and this has always been the case, when trade increases, cities increase. One such city, ah, Venice. Venice is one such city that develops. It develops because of this increasing trade. Cultural diffusion also happens. So, um, the, and this gets back to those intellectual ideas and technological developments. It's not just the Crusades that introduces Western Europe, but also this development of trade that takes place. And the idea that we have a European presence in this region is a testament to the Crusades. So by 1200, it looks like West Europe is becoming more complicated. It's increasing in activity. The population is increasing, which means there must be more food somewhere. There, there seems to be innovation. And then West Europe suffers a major setback. And that's the Black Death or the spread of the bubonic plague. So if you look at these red dots and these red dashes, not only are these trade networks, but this can also serve to sum up the spread of the Black Death um, from this region, from the Silk Road, from the crossroads of trade to West Europe. And the bubonic plague is going to move, 1349 is going to be the first year that we have an outbreak. Or no, I apologize, 1348. And then as the outbreaks begin, the outbreaks follow trade patterns into the interior of Europe, taking the bubonic plague with them. And given our situation today, this isn't such a hard thing to understand. So the bubonic plague spreads like wildfire. Within three years, and this is how it differs from today, within three years, you have approximately a quarter of the West European population dead. And that is a significant development. The, the bubonic plague is gonna be a traumatic event that alters West European history and West European development. The impact on the cities. Since, since your cities are so engaged with trade, the bubonic plague hits the cities hard. And you have a significant drop in the population and a significant decline of the cities, not just in terms of population, but in terms of activity as well. But the other thing is that the bubonic plague impacts the Catholic Church, because people turn to the church and they go, what do we do? Because the church has always served as the answer to crisis, and the Catholic Church has no answer. And the Catholic Church 
is going to begin to lose some prestige and some credibility in the eyes of the people. It's not to say that everybody becomes anti-church, but the church is going to lose the prestige that it held throughout a lot of medieval Europe. And the church is going to begin a, a, a process of declining as a centralizing and unifying agent of West Europe. The bubonic plague is the game changer, and it develops within West Europe a very individualistic attitude and a, a YOLA, if you will, a YOLA attitude. You guys remember, you only live once. YOLO, not YOLA, YOLO. So it develops this you only live once attitude, and that is going to deeply impact culture and civilization. Now, I apologize. If I can go back to the spread of bubonic plague, there's just one thing to put in there. The spread of the bubonic plague was because of fleas jumping off of rats onto humans. So rats stow away on ships. Ships are notorious for having rats on them. And as the ships go into their ports, the rats come into the cities. And as the rats go around the city, fleas jump off the rats, and the fleas are infected with the bubonic plague. Actually. So it's the rat that has the bubonic plague. The rat carries the virus. The flea sucks the blood out of the, the rat. Not all of the blood, obviously. But the flea sucks some of the blood out of the rat, jumps onto a human being, bites the human, and there's your transmission point, what you would call a vector of transmission. And in a lot of ways, you can see a parallel to coronavirus. It's animals and human beings interacting and inadvertent um, spread of viruses from animals to humans. And it's been part of our history for a long time. What we're going through is nothing new. So I wanna talk about two more things with West Europe. And I'm gonna end the show real quick because I wanna add in one more thing. Um, And this is an important thing to add in. Okay, so we also have another thing called the Little Ice Age. And it sounds so cute. It's the short version of the movie. We have that little um, squirrel, rat, and saber-toothed tiger. You know what I'm talking about. So the Little Ice Age, starting in about 1300 and going through till about 1800, we have, basically, we have global cooling. I know it's tough to wrap your head around that concept. But the temperature in the Earth goes down. And we have a, an expansion of the ice caps at the poles. And if you're in Northern Europe, this is a problem. Because the season for growing food shortens significantly. And now, this little ice age introduces an environmental challenge to West Europe. Not just to West Europe. It's also happening in North America. Um, some people think that's why the Mississippian civilizations declined, was because of the impact of the Little Ice Age. Now, if you're in the Middle East, if you're in um, the, the, the Fertile Crescent where agriculture began, this Little Ice Age isn't that big a deal. But West Europe is a significant deal. It shortens the growing season, which restricts food supply. And what that does is it leads to frequent outbreaks of famine. It, it leads to economic, social, and political upheaval. Now, you throw in this little ice age, and you throw in the bubonic plague as well, and West Europe is just a mess. And what's happening is that serfs, which we also can refer to as peasants for this purpose, begin to go into a series of revolts. Because think about it logically. Um, the, the landowners need serfs to farm their land. In 800, 900, 1,000, 1,100, and 1,200, the population is growing. So the landlords have a lot of serfs to work the land. This is great. This is fantastic. And the serfs need to live somewhere and they need to grow food. So the serfs are in a bad position because the serfs need the land. The lords have a lot of serfs to pick from. So the, the lords will say to the serfs, if you want to live on my land, you've got to follow the following rules. And the serfs are not in a position, or the peasants aren't in a position to reject that. 
But then you get the Black Death and you get the Little Ice Age. Food production goes down because of the Little Ice Age. And also there's just fewer farmers to work the land. So now the supply of labor that these landlords count on is being challenged. And initially what happens is that the landlords tie, try to tighten the rules on the service because they don't, want to, they don't want to lose the few laborers they have left. And this is what launches serfs slash peasants into revolt. They, in a sense, they're in a position of advantage. If they don't work the land, nobles are screwed. And there's not a lot of serfs to take up the slack at 1300s. So this revolt, especially in West Europe, starts to end the serfdom system throughout West Europe. And with the end of serfdom, peasants are allowed to move much more freely through society. And this is going to have a major impact down the road. So one of the things I want you to recognize is that the Little Ice Age and the Black Death, they both are disruptions to the way food is grown. And they lead to tensions between the landowning class and the working class, who we would call the serfs or the peasants. And that leads to rebellion from the serfs and the peasants. And that is going to lead to, in West Europe, the end of serfdom or the reduction of serfdom. East Europe, which wasn't as deeply impacted by the bubonic plague, will keep serfdom going. But that's a whole different story for a whole different class. All right. Now we go to East Europe. So we want to start with the Byzantine Empire. And the Byzantine Empire is basically where this says the Roman Empire. The Byzantine Empire in 476, actually, if I back off for one second, if you look at all this red and you look at this orange and you look at this light purple, um, you look at throughout North Africa and all of this, this whole region at one point was the Roman Empire. It's the empire you've always heard about. In 476, um, Germanic invaders are going to sack Rome, and the, the Roman emperor is going to be executed, and a Germanic chief is going to take over Rome. And with that, we have the historical fall of the West. However, the eastern part of the Roman Empire continues on. And their capital is the city called Constantinople. So in a way, Constantinople is the new Rome. So if Rome, the city of Rome, which had been decreasing in size and population and wealth for a long time, if they're the first, then Constantinople is the second in the new Rome. That's where the Roman Empire kind of shifts. And the way the Byzantines are going to do things is very much how the Roman Empire had always done things. So this represents a continuity of the Roman Empire. To put it another way, let's think of it this way. Let's say over time, the East Coast of the United States was becoming really run down and people were deciding that you just couldn't live in the East Coast anymore. And they all started to move to the West Coast. Washington DC was still the capital, okay, of the country, but most of the population and most of the leadership was moving West and they were setting up in Los Angeles. And then let's say something destroys the East Coast, and the East Coast no longer belongs to the United States. If somebody conquers it, somebody takes it over, and it becomes its own different region. And what's left of the United States shifts over to the West Coast. Los Angeles becomes the new capital. The people living on the West part of the United States still call themselves Americans, because they see themselves as continuing the American government. That's kind of what happened here with the Byzantine Empire. They saw themselves as just a continuation of Rome. But what the Byzantine Empire does that West Europe never does, or never does well, is they are directly connected with the Middle East, and they're connected with the Silk Road that leads you to East Asia. So the Byzantine Empire is gonna be much more active in trade, and have much more wealth coming through it, particularly the city of Constantinople. Um, when we talk about characteristics, um, I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm gonna go through this kind of quickly. Uh, don't stress overly about this. 
But one characteristic is what we call Caesaropapism. What that means is that the government controls the church. Caesar, the emperor, over Papism, the pope, or over the church. So the, the Byzantine Empire, the church, is below the political authority. So in West Europe, you have the separation of church and state, and they're competing for power. But in the Byzantine Empire, it is clear who is in charge. The emperor is in charge, and the state controls the church. One of the churches that is built is the um, Hagia Sophia, and that is built in Constantinople as one of the great churches of Christendom. It was one of those, it was revered as being the most beautiful building in Europe. And as one Christian commented, if God had a home on earth, if God had a castle, it would be the Agia, Agia Sophia. So you have this idea that this church becomes identified with the Byzantine Empire. And then lastly, the Byzantine Empire preserves a lot of the Greek culture as opposed to Western Europe which has more of a Latin-based culture. And so now we're developing kind of two different cultures. So the Byzantines are connected to the Greek world. Now, that right now, I'm in about five, 600 CE. Religiously, you have an Eastern and Western split of Christianity. The West is going to become the Roman Catholic Church. The East will become the Orthodox Christian Church. In 1054, the leaders of the East excommunicate the leaders of the West. And the leader of the West excommunicates the leader of the East. That represents a break within Christianity. And we call that the Great Schism. A schism means a break, um, a breaking up, a splitting. Lots of different things you could throw in there. So 1054 is when Christianity starts going like this. And you have the Western version, which is the Roman Catholic Church. You have the Eastern version, which is Orthodox Christianity. And they begin to develop two different understandings of Christian culture. Then we get to about 6, 700, 800. And that is the declining security of the Byzantine Empire. If you remember back to the Rashidun Caliphate, um, you remember that the Rashidun Caliphate in about six. 40, 650, expanded north. They run over a lot of the Byzantine Empire. And then when the Seljuk Turks come in, they bite into the Byzantine Empire even more. The Christian Crusades, when they come in, they come through the Byzantine Empire and actually will end up sacking Constantinople. By about the 12, 1300s, the Byzantine Empire is really nothing more in the city of Constantinople and some surrounding lands. And then there's a group that will come along, the Ottoman Turks, who will overrun it altogether in 1453, ending the Byzantine Empire. If you look at the Byzantine Empire as a extension of the Roman Empire, as the continuation of the Roman Empire, then really, after the fall of Rome in 476, the Roman Empire went on for almost another thousand years in the form of the Byzantine Empire. So that's your quick history. I do want you to pay attention to how the development and growth of Islam um, compromised the security of the Byzantine Empire. But the Byzantine Empire's wealth is largely made up of that trade that takes place. So one last thing is that the Byzantine Empire, with their Orthodox Christianity, undertake missionary efforts. Christianity is a proselytizing religion. It seeks out converts. And what happens is that the Byzantine Empire in 7-800 begin to send out missionaries to the north. And they go into the Germanic tribes that are up to their north. The Germanic tribes begin to convert over to Christianity. Now in the west, actually, you know what? I apologize. Let's go back through Germanic tribes. In the West, the Germanic tribes convert over to Roman Catholicism. In the East, they convert over to Orthodox Christianity. 
And the group that you want to know, that you want to associate with this transition, are the Slavic tribes. So the Slavic tribes are basically where we talk about like Serbia today, um, you know, that region of the world. Uh, the Ukraine, um, kind of Eastern Europe getting into Russia. So you have an ethnic group called the Slavic people, which is really just a Germanic tribe in that region. And there's two missionaries from the Byzantine Empire, Cyril and Methodius. 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 That's how I say it. These two missionaries leave the Byzantine Empire and they begin to work with the Slavic people to convert them to Christianity. Now, one of the things is here we have in the Byzantine Empire the language of Greece. But amongst the Slavic people, they have a Germanic tongue. Germanic tongue. Greek, in order to get any type of missionary work done, you have to bridge that language gap. And so what these missionaries do is they come up with a new alphabet system called the Krillic alphabet. And the Krillic alphabet, if you've ever seen Russian written um, in the alphabet of the Russian language, that's the Krillic alphabet. It's a syncretic language. It's the syncretism of, or the, the fusion of Greek and Slavic language coming together to create a new alphabet and a new language that we call the Kyrillic alphabet. So again, I give you that example to illustrate what happens when cultures come together and influence one another. Remember Swahili language along the East African states? That's a combination of Bantu and Arabic tongues. Same, same basic idea. But what happens is that while you have the spread of Christianity going north out of the Byzantine Empire, we're starting to see a series of city-states develop to the north, basically what is in today um, the Ukraine. We call this place Kievus. So you have a bunch of city-states in what is today um, uh, Ukraine. And one of those city-states, Kiev, is the largest of the city-states among these city-states. And Kiev Rus is getting involved in trade. And the leader of Kiev Rus decides to convert to Christianity so that he can do business with the Byzantine Empire. So your Orthodox Christianity starts to make its way up north into what is today Kiev. This leader could have converted to Roman Catholicism. He could have converted to Judaism. Um, he could have converted to Islam. But he chose the Byzantines because they were his immediate neighbor and trading partner. And also the story goes that Islam prohibited drinking and he wasn't a big fan of that idea. So the last thing is that this, this, the city-states of Kiev Rus is going to influence the development of the modern state of Russia. Now we're laying the groundwork for a future central state that's going to come along. And the culture of that state is being developed here in Kiev Rus and is heavily influenced by that Byzantine world. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm through. Again, one of the key points that I'd emphasize is when you think of the European region, Split it into two. West Europe looks very different than all the other regions of the world that we've looked at so far. And the bubonic plague kind of sets back their development and puts them down a different path. But the eastern part of Europe, which we would call the Byzantine Empire, that looks a lot like the other civilizations and cultures that we've studied. The only difference is, is that the Byzantine Empire is a past empire. New empires that are emerging, such as the Rashidun and the later the Abbasid and then the Turkish empires like the Seljuk, they're going to start to eat away at that Byzantine empire till it's off the map by 1453. So with that, um, if you have any questions, as always, bring them to class so that we can clarify any of the mistakes. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we have introduced you to all six regions of the first unit. So congratulations, unit one of nine is in the books. Thank you, talk to you later.